Okay, in this lecture, we're going to continue our study of chapter six, discounted cash flow valuation. So in the previous lecture, we learned how to extend the concept of time value of money to multiple cash flows. So we learned how to, to determine the future and present value of investment with multiple cash flows. And we have learned some special cases of cash flows called annuities. And annuities are very common in practice. In fact, most consumer loans come in the form of annuities. And there are other special cases of cash flows that are also closely related to annuities. So there is annuity due. Annuity due is just like ordinary annuity that we have learned in the previous lecture, except the cash flow stream begins immediately rather than at the end of the first period. So ordinary annuity Cash flow looks like this. Cash flows occur at the end of the period. With annuity due, cash flow occurs at the, at the beginning of the period. So equivalently, at the end of the previous period. So the present value of annuity due is the first cash flow, so there's no discount, and the second cash flow will be discounted once, so C over 1 plus R, and the third cash flow will be discounted twice. Let's see, over 1 plus R squared plus all the way to T's cash flow will be discounted T minus 1 times. So that's the present value of annuity due. And with a little bit of algebra manipulation, we can show that that is equal to 1 plus r times c over 1 plus r plus c over 1 plus r squared plus all the way to c over 1 plus r raised to the power of t. And that is present value of ordinary annuity. So the present value of annuity due is equal to 1 plus r times the present value of an annuity, or ordinary annuity to make a distinction between the two. Which makes sense because annuity due for each single each uh, cash flow is discounted one less time. So compare each cash flows, you can see that cash flows of annuity due are discounted one less time compared to cash flows of ordinary annuity. So it's 1 plus r times c over r times 1 minus 1 over 1 plus r. the t's. That is present value of annuity due. How about future value of annuity due? The future value of annuity due. Well, we've learned that future value is equal to present value times 1 plus r to t's. 
So the future value of a new to do, if we apply this simple future value formula, and this is equal to the present value of an annuity due, one plus r times c of r times one minus one over one plus r to t, that is the present value, times one plus r to t. So that is equal to one plus r times c over times. So this is one plus r to t minus one. And notice that this is equal to future value of annuity or ordinary annuity. So again, the future value of annuity due is one plus r times future value of ordinary annuity. Again, this is because if you look at the cash flows, the future values for each cash flows will be discounted one more time. So this is discounted, this compounded one more time. So this will be compounded t times, and this is compounded t minus one times, and this is will be compounded once, and there's no compounding. So to get the future value, cash flows of annuity due will be compounded one more time compared to ordinary annuity. So the future value of annuity due is greater by a factor of one plus r. So let's look at an example. So you're saving for a new house and you put $10,000 per year in account paying 8% per year. And the first payment is made today. And the question is, how much will you have at the end of three years? So this is asking, what is the future value of a three-year annuity due. So let's do a timeline. So you save $10,000 at the beginning of each period for the next three years. So 10,000, 10,000 here, and 10,000 here. So notice that there is no 10,000 here at the end of third year because all the cash flows will occur at the beginning of each period. So there's no 10,000 at the end of the third year. So the question is, what is the future value of these cash flows? So we can compound all of this. So we're going to use the future value formula for annuity due. So the interest rate is 8%. So 1 plus 0 0.08 times C is 10,000 over R, which is 0 0.08 times 1 plus 0 0.08 cubed minus 1. Okay. So that is the future value of an ordinary annuity times one plus R. That gives us the future value of annuity due. So that is equal to 35,000 and $61.12. So that is how much you will have at the end of three years. Okay, that's the annuity due. 
Next, there's a perpetuity. Perpetuity is a stream of identical cash flows that occur over infinite horizon. So it's like annuity, but with an infinite horizon. So cash flows occur at the end of each period, but indefinitely. So present value is C over one plus R plus C over one plus R squared plus C over one plus R cubed, etc. So we can simplify this using similar algebra manipulation. So, so that is the equation number one. I'm going to multiply both sides by one plus R. So one plus R times present value is equal to C plus C over one plus R plus C over one plus R squared, etc. Okay. So I'm going to subtract the first equation from the second equation. So it's the same trick that we did in the last lecture. So this minus this is R times PV that is equal to so this times this minus this. So this this will cancel, this this will cancel, this this will cancel, and so on. So we're going to have just C. So the present value of perpetuity is just C over R. Okay. So that's the present value of perpetuity. Or you can think of the uh, perpetuity as a limiting case of an annuity. So annuity with annuity, the present value is C over R times one minus one over one plus R, so T, okay? So when T tends to infinity, when T gets bigger and bigger and bigger, so this one plus R raised to the power of T will get bigger and bigger and bigger, and one over that inverse of that will become smaller and smaller and smaller. So this will tend to zero. So the term on the square bracket will tend to just one. So it will disappear. And the perpetuity will become it becomes a perpetuity. So the present value is just C over R when T goes to infinity. So when ten when t tends to infinity, annuity becomes perpetuity. So it's a perpetual annuity. Then perpetuity is commonly used to value preferred stock. You can see in this example, so firms sometimes issue preferred stocks. But despite its name, preferred stock is much like very long-term bond, okay? So it offers fixed amount of pay, the payments in terms in dividends for every quarter and indefinitely. So it pays off dividends every quarter the fixed amount of dividends every quarter indefinitely. So this cash flow stream is a perpetuity. And when firm issues issue a security, here in this case, prefer stock to investors in the market. Typically from hires investment banks, 
like Goldman Sachs or Merrill Lynch. And investment banks try to sell the security at the face value or par value. In this case, $100. In order to accomplish this, accomplish this investment bank typically set the price of the security equal to the present value of the cash flow associated with this particular security. So in this case, the present value is C over R. So the investment banks can determine, can figure out the required return that is appropriate for this security, then set the dividend accordingly so that the price or the par value is equal to the present value of the cash flows associated with this security. And investment banks can look at similar securities. So in this example, a similar issue of preferred stock that is already outstanding has a price of $40 per share and offers a dividend of $1 every quarter. So there's an old security. The present value is equal to C over R. So the price is $40 and dividend is $1. So required rate of return implied in this security is that is 2.5% per quarter. So and investment banks can use this rate of return to price this new security to set. So this firm wants to sell this preferred stock, new issue of preferred stock at $100 per share. And investors demand 2.5% of return per quarter for this type of security. So the firm can set the rate of return to be 2.5%. Then the firm can set the dividend, quarterly dividend to be $2 and 50 cents per quarter, okay? So if, if the firm set the offer to $2.50 of dividends, then preferred stock is going to sell at $100 per share as intended. So this is the, the first application of this kind of cash flow valuation to value securities. And we're going to learn how to use this kind of cash flow valuation techniques to value other securities like stocks and bonds in the next two chapters. Before we finish this chapter, we're going to look at how interest rates are quoted in the market. So the interest rates are quoted differently, perhaps because of tradition, legislation, or sometimes deliberately to trick you. So what does it really mean that a rate is quoted as 10% compounded annually, quarterly, daily, and continuously? So truth in lending laws in the US require the lenders disclose an APR on virtually all consumer loans, and this rate must be displayed 
on the loan document in a prominent and unambiguous way. But because of this, some of you some of you may have seen APR and may be familiar with APR. So APR stands for annual percentage rate and is prepared interest rate multiplied by number of periods per year. Okay. APR is per period interest rate times number of periods per year, which we're going to use M for that. And unfortunately, APR is not the actual interest paid or received after accounting for compounding that occurs during the year. The actual interest rate paid or received is called effective annual rate, which is EAR. So if you want to compare two alternative investments with different compounding periods, then you need to compute the EAR and use it for comparison. And let's look at an example. So if you're a saver, if you want to save money, and you have three options, then which option is the best if you want to save money? So bank A is quoting an APR of 15% compounded daily, and bank B is, off, is quoting an APR of 15.5% compounded quarterly, and bank C is quoting an APR of 16% compounded annually. Okay, so which banks is the best if you want to save money? Is it bank C because it has the highest APR? Or is it bank A because it, it has the most frequent compounding frequency? or bank P that is in the middle. So first consider investing money with bank C. So let's say you invest $100 with bank C, then the APR is 16% compounded annually. So over a year, there will be only one compounding at 16%. So, the, so at the end of the year, you're going to have so the future value of this is going to be $100 times 1 plus 0.16. So you're going to have $160, excuse me, $116, okay? So the effective rate is 16%, which is equal to APR. How about bank B, which is quoting an APR of 15.5% compounded quarterly. So you invest $100, then it will be compounded for every quarter, so four times in a year. So the future value of this is going to be 100 times 1 plus 155, 15.5% divided by 4. So that's the popular interest rate raised to the power of 4. Okay. And this is 
$116.42. Okay, your $100 invested in account with bank B will grow to $116.42 in a year. So you need to earn $0.42 cents more with bank B. So effective rate is 16.42%. So if you're a saver, then bank B is better than bank C. So how about bank A? So bank A is quoting an APR of 15% compounded daily. So you invest $100 today, so it will be compounded 365 times. So compounded every day. So the future value is 100 times 1 plus 15%, so 0.15 divided by 365 is the power of 365. So that is equal to 116 dollars and 18 cents. So bank A is worse than bank B, but still better than bank C. So the effective rate here is 16.18%. So if you're a saver, bank B is the best. It has the highest effective annual rate, followed by bank A and bank C. So if you're a borrower, the opposite will be true. Bank C will be the best, followed by A and followed by B. So as you can see here, it's really important that when you're comparing two alternative investments with different compounding periods, you want to compute the EAR and use that for comparison. But unfortunately, the APR is interest rate that banks are quoting, so you have to, do, to compute the EAR for yourself. So let's see how EAR and APR is related. So 1 plus EAR is equal to 1 plus APR divided by n raised to the power of n. Okay, so that is how APR and EAR are related. To see this, so Let's look at this. So that is equal to 100 times 1 plus APR divided by M raised to the power of M, right? If we were to use EAR directly, 100 times 1 plus EAR is 16.18%. 0.1618. So that is equal to $116.18. So that is equal to this. And this is 100 times 1 plus EAR. So this and this are equal. So 1 plus ER is equal to 1 plus APR over M raised to the power of M. So using this equation, given 
give an APR, you can serve for EAR like this, or given EAR, you can serve for APR. So let's look at an example. Depending on the issuer, a typical credit card agreement puts an interest rate of 18% APR and monthly payments are required. And what, it is, what is the actual interest that you pay on such a credit card? So in other words, what is the EAR on this credit card? So EAR, as you can see here, is equal to one plus APR over M raised to the power of M's minus one. So it's one plus point eighteen divided by twelve raised to the power of twelve. And minus one. So the EAR is nineteen point fifty six cents. Okay. So that's the actual interest rate that you're going to pay on this credit card. And EAR is typically greater than APR. So it's not surprising that banks like to quote APR rather than EAR. And let's look at the relationship between compounding frequency and EAR. Give the same APR. So APR is 18%, just like in the credit card example. So let's look at the effect of compounding frequency on the effective annual rate, okay? So when compounding frequency is annual, then M is one. So EAR, when M is one, EAR is equal to APR. So with, with annual compounding, AR is equal to EAR. How about when interest rates, interest are compounded semi-annually, so twice in a year, so M is two, the EAR is one plus 18 over two squared minus one, and the EAR is 18.81%, which is greater than the APR. How about interest are compounded quarterly? So M is four, and EAR is one plus point eighteen over four raised to the power of four minus one. So EAR is nineteen point twenty five percent. Yes, you can admit, uh, you can notice this that the as the M increases as we compound more frequently the EAR also increasing as well. The more frequently you compound, the greater the EAR. With monthly compounding, the EAR is this, 19.56 cent, okay? So it keeps on increasing. The question is whether As M increases, whether ER will it increase 
with un unbounded or whether it will convert to a certain finite number. So this is the question that Jacob Bonuri asked in 1683. So Bonuri asked whether the EAR, which is one plus APR over M raised to the power of M minus one, what's going to happen when we in keeps increasing compounding frequency? So increase compound frequency to monthly, to weekly, to daily, hourly, and so on, or continuously. And it found that it's going to converge to e to the APR month one. So when he was studying compound interest, he discovered natural number E. So E is defined as the limit of 1 plus 1 over m raised to the power of m. So that is how it's defined. It's, it's about 2.7. Okay, so this is all I want to talk about in this lecture. Thank you for watching. I will see you next class.